Navy seen it. For the record, the date is December 22nd, the final day of autumn. This is the deposition of Mr. Autumn's tenure of the season, reviewing his actions so that Miss Winter, in the courtroom, may be properly informed to take control of the village tomorrow. Mr. Autumn, the first order of business. You put in paperwork applying to retain your position for next year. We know that the date on that paperwork was the second day of your position this year. That is now three months ago. Has your opinion changed? Do you wish to withdraw your application? No, my opinion has not changed. I do not wish to withdraw from consideration. Very well. Then in addition to reviewing your actions on record, we will give a judgment at the end of this deposition as to whether or not you are fit to hold the position for the next year. Now, Mr. Otto, we have reviewed your reports of the happenings and actions taken during your tenure. You turned those reports in a week ago. Has anything else happened during the past few days? Ah, uh, yes, just one thing. A group of unruly teenagers have taken in the past week to damaging property, destroying food, and the overall being nuisances to the populace. We were able to get a few of them into custody before today, but others remained unaccounted for. While I, uh, we waited for this deposition to begin, I received a message. The guards force have managed to get the rest of them into custody. They are being held, awaiting a trial from you judges. Very well. We shall hear their case after this. There's nothing else. We shall proceed forward. Reviewing the events of this past autumn, we have seen how you helped design a system to further crop yield to something you call cover crops. Yes, the way they work is the area surrounds. On the other hand, one of your promised policies was put into place early this season. You sought to quote break down sex and gender barriers of socially assigned roles in the work. Uh, correct. Our studies have shown that women can farm just as well as men. Men can work efficiently as doctor's assistants. This program is designed to remove the stigma of what job roles are, for lack of a better term, manly and ladylike, without feeling lesser due to what our society has randomly chosen as jobs befitting of their sex. A more flexible workforce is one that is happier doing what they want to do. An entire workforce will be able to better adjust to our ever-changing world and nature fine theory, but since you've instituted this policy, there has been no visible change in the makeup of the workforce. <clears throat> Correct. It hasn't changed as quickly as I'd like, uh, but it hasn't been hurt, either. This is a defining trait of leadership. Some of our decisions and policies have noticeable effects in weeks. Others, such as this one, will likely take years before the results begin to blossom. But it can only do so if that policy is adhered to for the foreseeable future. If you tear it down now, that flexibility and happiness will never appear until something like this is attempted again. Well, we will decide on whether or not to keep that in place when we give our judgment for the possibility of your continued tenure. Now, all of these matters are fairly mundane and run of the mill. Nothing that we or Miss Winter couldn't have understood by reading your reports. What we wish to focus on here are a few events during your time in charge that need more information or for you to explain your actions. There is a matter of an essential trade agreement is necessary for our incoming winter that blew up under your watch. Yes, the uh, serial the murderer who has been active since spring, but we understand has had major changes in the situation during autumn. The legitimacy of our village's founding and independence from the kingdom coming into question. A large workers issue that you personally became embroiled in. We want you to explain everything that happened with these events, your actions, why you did what you did, so that Miss Winter may have a better understanding of these events and their consequences for when she takes over leadership tomorrow. You 
have the floor. Thank you, judges. I suppose I will go down these events in order, starting with the trade agreement. Mr. Summer, admittedly volunteering to not lead again next year, had made a trade agreement with the village of Corrig, uh, one that we've had in place for years, but this year, Mr. Summer promised a record-breaking amount of sheep's wool for them to use for coats and blankets for winter. In return, we were to receive about an equal share of salted deer meat so that food would not be scarce during our winter. To be fair, he was well on his way of achieving that goal, and that pace continued when I took over at the beginning of autumn. However, things became problematic. We had an overly powerful storm season. During one of those storms, the barn housing all the sheep had a large chunk of its roof cave in. The sheep standing under that part of the roof were killed. We tried to recover what we could, but their blood had soaked through the wool, making it unusable. The storm was still ongoing and expected to last several days longer, and a few options were floated. Among them was moving all the remaining sheep into another nearby barn that could be emptied. But doing so would mean exposing them all to the storm and rains during that move, making their, soaking their coats through, making their wool unusable for weeks until they completely dried out. When Mr. Summer devised this trade agreement, he knew that the timetable to achieve all the wool that he had promised would be tight, with little room for error. We didn't have time to sit down and bang out the numbers to see if we could still make it with the delays. I had to make a decision of what to do with the sheep then and there. Ultimately, I decided to keep them where they were, have the roof of that barn supported with makeshift planks until the storm could end. When the storm finally subsided, we began to take count. It became apparent we were not going to meet what Mr. Summer had promised. I delayed a bit, trying to figure out an alternative or what I was going to tell Corrig's chief. When it became clear that there was no other solution, no way to hide what had happened, I wrote to Corrig giving them an idea of what stock we would be able to provide and telling them we could negotiate a new deal on the basis of the lower output. A week later, I received their response. They were offended at us promising one amount, then changing that to a lower amount, just as they were on the cusp of winter, believing that we were intentionally sabotaging them and their chances of survival. called the deal off entirely, claiming they get their stock from Village de Moss. Outside of our initial contact and trade agreement made years ago, almost all of our village's communications with them have been through letter, including my own. <clears throat> but when they decided to end our agreement, I chose to go to their village myself to appeal to them directly. Once I was certain things were stable here after the storm, I began my journey to their village. Upon arrival, I was greeted by their representative of foreign affairs. They gave me a wonderful tour of their village, specializing in meat harvesting and production. I was amazed by their efficiency, in particular the storage methods that keeps food good to eat for months. I brought some of those ideas back here and implemented them. When the tour was finished, I was then taken to the chief's estate. Now, I am no fool. I played the part of a gracious guest taking in their tour, acting amazed at practices that are fairly standard, and being genuinely amazed by the creative ones that I have not seen before. But I know that that tour was just a way of delaying my visiting the chief. What they were delaying for, I couldn't figure out, but the chief certainly didn't seem happy to see me. 
I had hoped by coming in person the attitude they held up in their letter would be dropped. It was not. He blamed the seasonal leadership, my leadership, for being too light. He pushed the idea that our workers are lazy and that if we simply worked harder, tried harder, we could still achieve the goals laid out. With what sheep? I tried to bite my tongue for his insults. I believe I continued to act in a professional manner, but my kind attitude became one of sharp, short responses and reiterated that I was there to try and negotiate a new deal based on the lower stock. He wouldn't hear it. He said, that we, ne he said we needed to uphold our original agreement or have none at all. There was a moment where I thought about telling him we could and then figuring out how to do that when I got back or just lie and tell them we would and then not. And then with the meat on our doorstep and winter already here with it, they would have little choice but to accept whatever stock we did have. Sometimes I wonder if I should have done that. But I couldn't. Not just because it was a lie, but because it would destroy any chance of our village rekindling relationships with them in the near future. And not to mention the possibility of them denying us anything at all when winter was also upon us. Even the possibility of war. So, I told them the truth. And they kicked me out. I returned with my head hung low, but I couldn't let this attitude consume me for too long. Every day that passed, the women became a bit colder, more biting. Winter would not stop its approach from my wallowing. I reached out to other villagers, Dormer, Keegan, anyone who would answer our letters. All of them said they were already stocked for the winter. It left me without much of a choice. I know our village hates to associate with them in any way. But I reached out to Gardra, the city surrounding the king's castle. Sure enough, a shop owner there was willing to make a trade with us. We won't get the amount of meat we would have with Korig, but it should be enough to limp our way through winter. Regarding our serial killer problem, since spring, a serial killer has been active within our village. There are signs that they may have been active earlier than that, but the guards force was unable to put together consistent detail connecting multiple killings until this past spring. The killer would remove one or two of the victim's teeth. They were killed with sharp objects, knives or swords, a fire poker in one case. In all of these instances, the victims were killed um, cleanly. They had little to no chance to strike back, and outside of the killing wounds, there was no further damage to the bodies or face. Yeah, outside of the calling card of the removed teeth. The guards force theorize that if the earlier killings are connected, it means the killer has gotten better and more organized over time. These killings continued into summer and showed no signs of slowing down when I took over in autumn. I met with the guards force early in my tenure, instructing them that the next murder that was connected to this killer, they were expressly forbidden to touch the crime scene until I had been notified and examined it myself. 
looking back, I realize this may have been a bit out of bounds for my position. This is meant to be in the Guard Force's purview. But throughout spring and summer, they examined 10 plus killings. And when I took over, it became clear that they had made no progress in figuring out who was behind all this. I felt that if I took over, I could crack the case, prove that I had. Well, in addition, I, I feared perhaps someone on the guards force was the one committing the deeds, covering up their crimes while on the scene, or perhaps covering up for someone they knew. I could not be certain that the guards force hadn't become corrupted somehow. The first death I was brought to wasn't much different than the others that I had heard about. The home was mostly left untouched, though a few objects of value were gone. The body lay in the center of the floor. Looking around the room, I theorized that the killer was already in the home when the victim came in. The killer, sitting in a chair in darkness, the victim probably didn't even see the killer when they came in. As they got settled in for the evening, the killer moved to attack, either of their own volition or because the victim finally saw them. One precise wound in their chest. No chance of fighting back. Most likely tool used was a sword. Judging by the small pool of blood slightly separated from the body, it's likely the killer wiped their blade clean before moving on to their next go. As with all these killings, the victim was missing a tooth. Pulled out, not terribly cleanly. Otherwise, the crime scene didn't seem to have anything of note. No noticeable shoe prints, no... nothing to go off of. With these points in mind, I sat down with trusted counsel. We went over the details one by one. We tried figuring out who the victim knew, who could be seen as an, an enemy. We cross-referenced people this victim knew with people the other victims knew. We couldn't seem to find any matches. As we went over this case, trying to solve it, another body turned up. Same pieces of evidence, same lack of any ties to who might have committed these murders. At this point, I figured even if we couldn't piece together who the killer was, we could present this evidence to the guards force, get everyone on the same page on all the details, which we did. Unfortunately, they already knew all these points. I guess I should have known that. We couldn't even get a glimmer as to who committed these murders. All we came to the conclusion of was that they were connected, performed by a serial killer, which they, obviously, already knew. It turns out I may not have been as good of a detective as I had hoped, or perhaps the guards force aren't corrupted like I had thought. They, more or less, laughed us out of their base. I returned to my council and told him how it went. Poorly. It was then that he had a brilliant idea. He pointed out that up to now, the killer has only been killing people who were citizens of the, vill of the village. We don't get much in the way of tourists. So they could kill whoever they wanted at any time they so desired. So why not make a prime target, available only for a limited amount of time? If this killer really was a collector of teeth, they would not be able to skip the chance of someone being in town for only a few days. Figuring out who was going to be our prime target was the difficult part. I thought about dressing myself up, but unfortunately I am 
too recognizable. Perhaps someone else disguising one of our own as some foreign dignitary, but that would mean they would need to be in on the plan, and I did not believe that any of our own citizens would willingly offer themselves up as bait. It was a betrayal of trust. But if we were right, we would be ready to protect them. If we were wrong, then nothing would happen and their visit would go smoothly. I didn't see a better alternative. I wrote a letter to them straight away, offering them to come see our village. Now that we were meant to be doing business together, the shop owner from the kingdom was our best bet at luring someone in from the outside, under the guise of viewing our setup and his eventual stop. He accepted the invitation, and we made a big show of it all. A town meeting beforehand, a clear statement of who he was, why he was here, how long he'd be here, and a staged slip-up to let out where he was staying. He arrived, unaware of what we were planning. We had guards for us with him at all times during the, the day, but during the evenings, only guards posted outside of his room, or at least that's what was visible. The killer came on night two. They were unaware that we had set a trap. Sprang! In an effort to not let our new business partner know what we were doing, I may have called for the springing of the trap too early. They weren't cornered yet, and they slipped out. We had planned for this. We were able to give chase to them before they entered the room, corralling them into another room where we thought we would have them cornered. I was not counting on them leaping out a third story window into a tree and climbing down from there. We gave chase to them and were able to keep up with but with the winding nature of our streets and homes catching up to them became incredibly unlikely. We were able to chase them outside of the village, into the surrounding woods, but it was night time. They lost us in the darkness. We continued searching, but even with lantern light, we were unable to find the killer. I pushed for continued searches of the nearby woods every night and day to try to find this killer, or their body, if they had been killed by wildlife. But we were having no luck with either outcome. Two weeks into this, and my attention was being forced into other areas, and the captain of the guards force was pressuring me to stop all the, as he put it, needless searching. I had no choice but to give up on finding them. Looking back, I realized this entire thing could have put our new and necessary trade agreement at risk. Admittedly, that possibility had not crossed my mind while we were devising the plan or executing on it. But my spring of the trap so early meant that our guest from the kingdom was never aware of what we were doing, and our agreement is still in effect. Yes, by spring the trap so early, it meant the killer was able to get away. Uh, but this all happened over a month ago, and there has been no sign of the killer since. No unexplained deaths, no bodies turning up missing teeth, so I would say my plan was a success. They either fled the village entirely, or were killed by some wildlife out in the woods. 
And that is the end of our serial killer. For now. Hopefully for good. Regarding our village's autonomy and independence from the kingdom. Yes, by spring the trap so early, it meant that our guest from the kingdom was never aware of the role he served as unknowing bait. However, that doesn't mean our problems with them or the kingdom were non-existent. Sometime after our trade agreement was made, and after we chased the killer into the woods, a cry from the kingdom arrived. I was busy trying to sort out the killer's location issue when I was notified of their arrival and that they had already begun to read their message in the town's central square. Arriving in the middle of their message, I mostly got that we need to pro needed to provide record of land deeds or a will to the king. If we could not manage that, They would take over our village. When the announcement was finished, the crowd began to disperse. The people certainly seemed miserable. Pushing through them to the crier, I introduced myself as the leadership of the village at this time. He handed me a copy of the announcement he had just made and left in a hurry, giving me no chance to ask questions. The copy said that the kingdom had recently gone through its records and found no sign of any paperwork indicating the right for this village to exist. Now, I have to imagine this was either a lie or that this paperwork was intentionally misplaced. The announcement said that we would need to provide the king with proof of our autonomy from the kingdom, either in the shape of the original land deeds or a will from our founder leaving the land to the people of the village. My trade agreement with the shop owner of the kingdom must have drawn the king's attention to us. And now they were looking for any way to pull us back under their kingdom. We all know the story of our founder, Michael Hobson, being fed up with the kingdom's way of handling, well, pretty much everything. He struck out on his own, set up a home and trade shop here, and through his earnings, purchased the block of land from the kingdom, ensuring his freedom to manage it as he saw fit. And as we now see fit over a hundred years later. Because of this, our relationship with the king and his kingdom are, well, shaky at best. Finding myself with no time to, bo to attend to both the serial killer's location issue and this one. I had to wrap that one up. Everyone under my employ began searching immediately for the required documents. Normal places were searched thoroughly. This courthouse, the season leader's offices, and the original home of Michael Hodgson. Searching through everything we could find. Personal papers, business sheets from his time, anything that might have what we were looking for. Throughout a lot of these papers were whispers and mentions of what we were looking for. But we couldn't find the documents themselves. We've all been taught that Hodgson left this village in the care of its citizens through his will. But I imagine none of us has seen the actual document proving that. And the land deeds would not be something any of the citizens would care to see. With every normal place and many abnormal places searched through and through and still turning nothing up. I was quickly running out of ideas, clues, and options. I was getting desperate. I would not be the one to lose this village's independence. I returned to Hodgson's home. The place is preserved, a key piece of our history. I was gentle, careful, but began rifling through everything I could. 
desks that were still filled with papers, books on the shelf. Through all this, I got a better glimpse into our founder's mind. He seemed to have a thing for poetry or songs, finding many full poems. Uh, none of them his own work. Portions of songs written to the side spaces of his business's paperwork. He wrote the same notes down several times in several different places. I started taking notes of my own, of documents in this preserved place, what was on them, so that I could study them back at the office. Through those studies, I was hit with something. He wrote the same notes down several times. Initially, I thought it was to hammer in something he needed to learn, or simply that we, we learn the same lessons throughout our lives several times, framed differently each time. But I began to wonder if there was a a deeper reason as to why he had written these things down multiple times. I spoke with our historian and record keepers, and while Hodgson lived, and worked to the age of 87, there is no one alive today who knew him while he was. They gave their own thoughts as to why he had written these things down multiple times, but they were either identical to my original thoughts or didn't seem to lead anywhere. During all this, weeks went by, and I didn't feel like I was getting any closer. I was up late one night, studying everything I could again from the beginning, just trying to find any kind of hint. When it hit me, Hodgson lived to be quite an old man, and he continued running his business through that time as well. Maybe the reason he had written things down multiple times is because he was having trouble remembering things. I dove back into his documents with this new frame of mind, noticed the increasing pattern of songs and poems. There are studies that show that memories that seem forever lost in old age can be returned with the right type of trigger. Music being a common one, poetry may have been another for us. There were many poems scattered throughout his papers, but from my notes I remembered finding the same poem twice. Going back to the original papers, I was able to find that same poem, untouched, and then the copy of that poem. On the copy, he had crossed out certain words and phrases and replaced them with others. When I first saw it, I thought it was nonsense. Just some flight of fancy that had taken him during one of his days working, trying to write poetry of his own. But reading it again, and with this new mindset, I wondered if this was a guide to where he may have stored things. So that if he forgot, he could turn to this to remember. In darkened space and hollowed bottom. The place of my passion is the place of my past, the place of family present, and the place of strangers future. Dark in space could mean any place the light doesn't quite reach. It was too vague. Hollow bottom, a hollow tree stump, or who knows what else. The place of my passion, the place of my past. Perhaps some place in the kingdom before he set out on, on, out on his own? That same place, the place of family present. Now, we all know Hodgson never married, never had kids. Part of the reason he left the village to the citizens. And then, the place of strangers' future. Ours, I suppose. Hodgson didn't have many passions, mostly because he put so much of himself in the, into the few that he did have. His home, this village, and his shop. It was the middle of the night, but I demanded that the preservationist of Hodgson's place be awoken and meet me at his workshop. Lighting candlelight all within, I needed to find the darkened space. There were plenty of corners the light couldn't quite reach. But there didn't seem to be anything there or any way to hide anything 
hollowed out. Hollowed bottom. Flipping all the chairs over. Nothing there. Then I saw it. his desk. His work desk has a solid back, meaning the underside will remain dimly lit at all times. Climbing underneath, cattle in hand, I was able to find a lift. There was some kind of hidden compartment beneath the main portion of the desk, separate from any of the drawers. I pushed at it, tried pinching areas that were loose, looking for any way to open this thing. I had others try their hands at it, but none of us could seem to figure out just how this was meant to be opened. We fiddled with this thing for days. As we approached the end of autumn, desperation truly sunk in, and I asked something I'll admit I am surprised that you can give it a thought to. I asked the preservationist if we could break that area open. He was dumbfounded and then furious, shouting me out of the workshop at that time. I'll admit, it was a dumb idea for me. I have no idea what is in that compartment and just how valuable and fragile whatever is in there is. But I couldn't figure it out. I ran out of time. I couldn't find the will or the deeds. I... Uh, Fail in this regard. Now you know all the details. It'll, it'll be up to you to finish this. You're free to pursue whatever leads you wish, but I have confidence that what we're looking for is in that compartment. That's the best lead I can give you, and I hope you have better luck opening it than I did. And the final event, a large workers' rights issue I was involved in. While at the office one day, studying my notes on Hodgson's documents, I heard some of our da staff members dealing with a, uh, I don't think irate is the right word, but definitely upset Matt. Coming out of my closed office, I pushed everyone back to what they needed to do and escorted the man back into my office, offering him to sit down, try to calm himself, explain what was happening. He didn't calm himself. He didn't wait to launch into his problem. His wife had been injured volunteering for the night watch of our village's walls, attacked by a wolf saved by other night's watch. They brought her back into the village and, uh, and she was patched up by our doctors. But her leg will take time to heal, months to be exact. She works in an office in the village. She could make it to work on the crutches crafted for her and do her job just as well as before, or so he said. The problem came to moving quickly. Now, nothing in her job really requires her to do so. But certain employees were starting to get annoyed at how much space she took up getting in and out of areas and how slowly she had to move. Soon, higher-ups began speaking to her, then pulling her into rooms to tell her she needed to speed things up. Either she needed to get better quicker, or she needed to move physically quicker, which would only result in hurting herself and causing the injury to heal improperly, if at all. She requested then that accommodations be made to the office space to allow room for others to walk around. 
They refused that. She then offered to take time off if they were willing to hold her position until she could recover. They agreed to giving her time off, then followed it up with a permanently statement. They fired her. She and the husband took their complaints to the workers advocacy group in the business. The advocacy group told her she had no ground to stand on. The husband was unsure if this was some sick way of making fun of her condition. They spoke with any crier and newsman who would listen, but most of them dismissed her story as an outright lie or unworthy of their time. Ultimately, it all resulted in no change. Feeling like they had nowhere else to turn to, the husband had come to the seasonal leadership just trying to get an idea of where to go next. It only took me a moment of thinking before I told him I would look into this myself. He was surprised, unsure of what to say, spluttering out a thank you, but also an are you sure he really didn't want to bother. Just get an idea of where to go next. I assured him and then ushered him out. The immediate thought was I need to verify what he had told me. First, I spoke with the news criers. Most of them were able to confirm that they had at least had conversations with the husband or wife. Those that didn't take the story up gave excuses that they couldn't believe the story was true. An employer based in this village would never be so cruel to its own. A wonderful optimism. The few that did take the story up said they made their announcements for the standard amount of time, three days. When the story didn't gain any traction or show any signs of things changing, they moved on to the next. I was starting to understand why these people felt so adrift at sea, with no idea which direction to turn to. They had been abandoned by their fellows. Next, I spoke with the advocacy block in the company. They were able to confirm that they had conversations with the wife, though they were unwilling to confirm they had said she had no ground to stand on. They didn't deny it, but they wouldn't confirm it either. Saving face, no doubt. For themselves, or for the company. That's when I began to get suspicious, suspicious of the company itself being rough, that something larger was at play. I thought about going undercover, but just like the idea of disguising myself for our serial murderer trap, I am too recognizable, too well known to be able to get away with that. And I was still trying to deal with the Hodgson case. Thankfully, I was able to pull one of my aides in catching them up on everything that I had been told and the results of my own investigation. They agreed to go on my stead and report back to me every day. It took some time to get them into the company and more to get the employees comfortable enough with them to start to get answers. Their first few reports required me to teach them how to handle things. They were being too blunt, too heavy-handed, indicating a real sense that they were there looking for information. After a few times of trying to teach them to be more subtle, their following reports are more in line with what we needed. There were plenty of rumors flying through the employees underneath. Turns out most of them are tight-lipped around strangers, but once they opened up, they spilled everything. It wasn't just the wife's unreasonable firing, but terrible treatment of firings all around. Getting the employees to talk was good, Getting the executives who fired her was what we needed. My aide was able to get one of the higher-ups to become more friendly with them. That guy told our aide that the wife was never fired. That she had quit on her own. That she was tired of working for the company. Going off of all the information given to me from the news criers, 
the employees' rights block, and even the employees themselves, this guy was lying. I decided to make a play. I told the aide to push him for more information. That if he was unwilling to give any of it, then they could threaten him with revealing that he had lied to the town criers. It was risky, but it would speed things up. And it worked. The guy gave everything up. Turns out the company had fired the injured woman because she had made one of the higher-ups feel uncomfortable. The moving around on crutches made them, made them feel like she was moving un, unnaturally and demanded that she be let go as soon as possible. When she asked for more space to be offered to the office space, that was all the excuse they needed. And this was all the information that I needed to move forward. I requested a trial be held in this courtroom by you, Judges 3, which was granted. I presented our case with the express intention of having the woman reinstated into her position. You denied that motion. You could not agree that one person's word from working undercover was as trustworthy as a higher-up employer. Even if that person was a direct aide of the government. You concluded that while their position does lend credence to the possibility, you would not take it as actual fact. With no one else in the room at the time to verify what he had said, you decided it was all hearsay. The case was dismissed. And she was not reinstated to her position. I sat in the office that evening, sulking in my failures. I'll admit I felt, maybe even feared, that that would be the end of this. The next morning, it was made incredibly apparent it would not end there. There was a large crowd outside of the leadership offices, protesting. I inquired what they were protesting, and one of them told me it was against the company firing the injured woman. Pointing me to that company and heading there myself, I found an even larger crowd outside picketing the business. Turns out the, the husband had gone back to the news criers after the dismissal of her case, and they all agreed that it was necessary information, making their announcements that evening. By morning, people had gathered and begun to protest. They made it clear that they would not allow the ill treatment of one of their fellow villagers. Initially, I did nothing. I stood by your judgment and believed that in time, the crowd's energy and physical presence would disperse. They did not. And after a few days, most of the protesters stopped working themselves. The productivity of our village came to a grinding halt, which has many major problems, but among them was the wool that we still need to get our trade agreement. With that on shaky ground and winter almost here, I had to make a definitive move. I drafted a law that requires all employers to give reasonable accommodation. And from here on out, to show increasing steps of discipline before firing an employee. If the employee decided to take their case to the courts, the judges would be required to go over requests from the employee, reports from the employer, and make a determination of whether the firing should be upheld or overturned and the employee reinstated. Unfortunately, I could not find a legal standing in which I could make this retroactive. By doing this, I was already overstepping my boundaries as seasonal leadership, but felt this needed to be done 
to rectify the issue in some way and to satisfy the villagers' want for justice. The people celebrate when the criers delivered the news and they return to their lives shortly after. I sat in the office feeling like I had made a great accomplishment. This was finally done. Two days later I learned it wasn't. Now came the employers. They weren't anywhere near as large in number and they came only the seasonal leadership demanding to speak with me. They cussed and shouted, threatened me and my aides, but I would not back down, especially when none of them could give a viable reason as to why the decree should be repealed. With no luck changing me, then they turned to you judges, claiming I had overstepped my responsibilities, made a decree that was outside of my purview. I know the deliberation went on for some time, but ultimately while agreeing that I had gone above and beyond what my office initially allowed, you agreed with my decree, and it would be upheld for the remainder of the season. The employers went back to their cushy positions, grumbling but unable to do anything else. I believe the real reason they went back with their tails between their legs is because they knew that the employees outnumbering the employees protesting outnumbered them about 50 to 1. The employers could never create a caucus large enough or strong enough to accomplish what they could. With that, I was unable to get the woman her original job back. But I was able to place her in a job as a government aide. She seems very happy. I know with my decree, I push the boundaries of what the seasonal leadership is allowed to do. I know that that caused a large schism among you judges. And that the deliberation over whether to uphold it or not was quite contentious. But in the end, that decree was my choice to make. I know I did the right thing. And if that's the reason you deem me unfit to fulfill the role of Mr. Autumn next year, then I will leave this courthouse with my hand held high, knowing I made the right decision for the people of this village. And that is all I have to say on these matters. We are ready to hand down our verdict. Mr. Autumn. You have made decisions that have undoubtedly helped this village, but you have also made egregious errors we cannot ignore. In reviewing your actions and accounts of what has happened this year, comparing them to those of the previous year, your first year in this position, we do see you made improvements. You still needed to be better for your position and your village. We believe from what you have attested to here today that you know that and will try to do so, and for that reason, we judge that you will remain as Mr. Autumn for the next year, and your policy shall remain in place. This court is adjourned.
yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I'm just um. Yeah. <laughs> 